Good morning, everyone. I, yeah. <laughs> great audience, great. Uh, so my name is Bernd Moore. I'm from Uli Supercomputing Center. I'm one of uh, Ward's uh, co-chairs for this conference. And uh, I'm here to introduce the first speakers of our uh, ACM, IEEE CS, Society Awards sessions. And our uh, first uh, winner is Kishaf Bingali. Uh, he got the, uh, oh, okay, right, the Ken Kennedy Award. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Kishaf is uh, chair of grid and distributed computing in the Department of Computer Science in the U University of Texas at Austin. And he's also part of other institutes there and so on. I mean, he's, he's a, a, a well-known guy. He's a fellow of all the uh, um, societies and uh, AWS, uh, received already uh, the, the Babbage Award in, in 2023. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to basically steal the time uh, for him. So, uh, Kishaf, please come up. And uh, we will be happy to hear more about your thoughts on parallel programming and lessons learned in the past 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. Bill. Wonderful. Thank you for that kind introduction, Bern. So a few minutes ago, back in the green room, Bernd asked me, how do you pronounce your last name? And I said, Bernd, don't worry about it. You know, anything close to Pingali is fine. He said, no, no, I want to get it right. And I said, well, it's Pingali. And he said, well, in German, we would have said Pingali. And I said, you know, if you're going to try and remember all of this, you'll forget everything else that you wanted to say. And sure enough, you know, he was so intent on pronouncing my last name correctly that he forgot some of the other things that he told me he wanted to say. That's good. Bunt and I are good friends. We've known each other a long time. So thank you again for that kind introduction. I want to begin by thanking the Ken Kennedy Awards Committee. It's really a great honor for me to receive the Kennedy Award this year. Like many of you in the audience, I knew Ken, and I served on lots of committees with him, both program committees and at the national level. And like all of you, I miss his technical wisdom, his sense of humor, and his leadership. I also want to thank all of my research students and uh, postdocs, collaborators over the years for all of their hard work that has made this very special moment possible for me. And then finally, I want to thank all of you for getting up early, having a quick breakfast, and coming here to listen to what I have to say. From the very beginning of parallel computing, it's been recognized that computer architectures are very complicated and that, that those complications need to be hidden from the vast majority of people who just want to use parallel computers in order to get their job done. So these are domain programmers. They have some computational science problem, big data problem, whatever it is that they want to solve. And they don't really want to get into the intricacies of parallel architectures because their goal is productivity, get their job done as quickly as possible. There's only one way that I know of to hide complexity, and that is through abstraction. And the goal, therefore, is to design abstractions that are high level enough that they hide a lot of the complexity of parallel architecture from Joe programmers, while at the same time being amenable to being implemented efficiently by a different class of programmers that we'll call Stephanie programmers. So Stephanie programmers are the small number of expert parallel programmers who implement these abstractions. Joe programmers use these abstractions. The question, of course, is what should these abstractions be? If the abstraction level is very high, like a whole lot of languages that have been designed in the past, including HPF, for example, it makes Joe's task easier, but it makes Stephanie's task very difficult because the difference in abstraction level between the low-level parallel architectures and the programming abstractions is too high to be bridged easily. If, on the other hand, the abstraction level 
If, on the other hand, the abstraction level is very low, then in that case, you haven't really done anything very much for the Joe programmers, so people are not going to use those abstractions either. And the goal, therefore, is to find this sort of golden mean. So abstractions that are high enough in level that they hide a lot of the complexity from Joe programmers, the Joe programmers are likely to use them, while at the same time, Stephanie programmers can implement them efficiently. So these are the kinds of questions. These are the kind of problems that my research group and I have been working in for the past 30 years or so. What I thought I would tell you about today is some of the most important lessons that we have learned in my research group during the course of this work. These are not necessarily the most important lessons in parallel programming or anything of that sort. Rather, these are the kind of lessons that I wish some senior faculty member or senior researcher at a conference like this 30 years ago would have taken me aside, whispered into my ear and said, listen, son, here are some lessons that you really need to keep in mind. And more importantly, if I had had the perspective to understand what I was being told, it would have saved me a lot of time during those 30 years. So one way to look at uh, what I'm going to tell you about is this quote from one of my favorite authors, Ernest Hemingway, in his famous book, Death in the Afternoon, which is about bullfighting in Spain, he writes, there are some things which cannot be learned quickly, and time, which is all we have, must be paid heavily for their acquiring. They're the very simplest things, and because it takes a man's life to know them, the little new that every man gets from life is very costly and the only heritage he has to leave. So typically, Hemingway-esque prose and sentiments and so on, but I think it kind of captures the kind of lessons that I want to talk about today. So with that, let's get to the very first lesson, and that is, it's better to be wrong once in a while than to be right all the time. So this sounds paradoxical. Surely it's better to be right all the time. So what is this lesson all about? This is a lesson that we first learned in the context of instruction level parallelism, which is probably the simplest kind of parallelism. Back in the early 60s, companies like IBM, CDC, and so on started designing ILP processors. And the basic idea was very simple. They took basic blocks, which are single entry, single exit uh, pieces of code, computed dependencies between those instructions, and then executed the instructions in data flow order. What these folks realized very quickly is that basic blocks are very small, as you know. So for a risk instruction set, there are about five instructions. So you have about four instructions that in principle you can try and exploit some parallelism, but then you get to a conditional branch. And if you wait until the branch condition is resolved before proceeding, well then you have a very narrow window of instructions and you can't really exploit much parallelism. Now, architects are nothing if not ingenious, and so they came up with a bunch of techniques on the 36091, for example. When the processor came to a conditional branch, it started fetching instructions from both sides of the branch, and then when the branch condition got resolved, it threw away the instructions on the wrong side and continued with the instructions on the correct side. You could go beyond this. You could also decode instructions. You could execute them conditionally and so on. But very quickly, you get to the next problem, which is you get to the next set of branches, and you can't afford to wait over there. And so you can keep doing this. And if you think about it, essentially the execution then looks like a tree, like the one I've shown you over there. The starting basic block is at the root. You have a branch to two sides. You start fetching, conditionally executing from both sides. When you get to the next set of branches, you just keep continuing. At some point, that first branch condition will get resolved. You throw away everything you did on the left-hand side, and you keep going in this way. So if you think this through, essentially what you're doing is the amount of useful work that you're doing is proportional to the height of this tree. The amount of resources that you've consumed, however, is proportional to the size of this tree, which is exponential in the height of the tree. So you're consuming exponential amount of resources in order to get, at best, this kind of linear speed up. And so there were a bunch of papers written back in the mid-70s 
Reisman and Foster is one example, where they basically said this approach to bypassing conditional branches is never going to work because you need these enormous amounts of resources just to get very small amounts of speed up. So ILP, this way of uh, exploiting ILP is never going to work. So ILP is dead, we can all go home. Well, no, today if you talk to even your undergrads in computer architecture, they tell you that the right way, which people realized a uh, while afterwards, is branch speculation, as we call it today. When you get to a branch, you don't go down both sides of the branch, you make an educated guess about which way the branch might go, and you start fetching and conditionally executing only along that path. If you come to another branch, you do the same thing again. If your guesses were correct, well then you commit those results and you're good, otherwise you back up and you go down the other way. Now, this approach is reasonable, efficient, only if most of the time you're guessing correctly. So that led to all of this wonderful work on dynamic branch prediction by a lot of people in the architecture community. Today, all superscalar processors use this idea. This idea of speculative execution is very important. We tend to underestimate it or overlook it completely in the sense that if you open up a book on parallel programming, you probably won't find anything about speculation. And that's because I think all of our intuitions come from sequential computing. If you're just executing one instruction at a time, you don't need speculation. The moment you go parallel, right, some kind of speculation is going to be necessary. So this is a very important mechanism for parallel computing. We'll come back to it later. Uh, just Let's give this a name, speculative execution, very important. Infallibility, in other words, being right all the time, is for popes, not for parallel computing. The second lesson is related to the first one. In my opinion, dependence graphs are not the right foundation for thinking about parallelism. I'm going to use array processors, so SIMD parallelism to make this particular point. So starting in the mid 70s, Seymour Cray, lots of people started designing these amazing vector machines. The question was where would vector instructions come from? There's a very influential line of work that started at Illinois from uh, David Cook's group and then Ken Kennedy's group later at Rice, where they said, here's what we're going to do to find vector instructions. We're going to look at innermost loops, like the loops that I've shown you on the right. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute dependencies between different iterations. And roughly speaking, I'm oversimplifying here, if there are no dependencies between different iterations, so the read-write sets of different iterations are disjoint, and the operations we're doing in the statement are simple enough, well, then we can generate vector code. So the very first loop over there, you can see each iteration is reading and writing into a set of locations which is disjoint from the uh, re locations read and written by other iterations. <clears throat> and so all vectorizing compilers today would generate vector code for that first loop. The second one is a recurrence, so there is an overlap between read-write sets because each iteration is reading a location written to by the previous iteration. So most compilers would not generate vector code for this. You can exploit properties of addition and so on, but we're not going to worry about that. The third one looks sort of like the second one, but if you look at the subscripts, you see that it's every iteration is writing to even locations, reading from odd locations. And so again, this can be vectorized because there's no overlap in the read-write sets between different iterations. So this kind of reasoning about odd, even reiteration uh, locations and so on can be generalized. They're called dependence tests. And for about 20 years, starting in uh, 1975 roughly, uh, David Cook and Kennedy, people like that, invented a whole lot of these array subscript analysis tests. They're called GCD, Banerjee, Lambda, Omega, entire cottage industry. Now, way back in 1972, Paul Foutrier, who's one of the great people in this field, he had pointed out to us that this problem of array dependence analysis can be formulated in terms of integer linear programming. And I've shown that at the bottom for the third loop. It's just that in our community, somehow we didn't quite realize the importance of that. And then it took a while for us to realize, oh yeah, all of these dependence tests can really be formulated in terms of integer linear programming. 
Today, all vectorizing compilers, so ICC, GCC, all of them incorporate these kinds of integer linear programming uh, techniques in order to find the kind of vector parallelism that we've talked about. So this dependence graph approach has been a tremendous success, in my opinion. Uh, compilers today can vectorize and parallelize and transform uh, dense linear algebra codes. Similarly, for stencil codes or finite difference codes, which you guys are experts in far more than I am, right? there are a very impressive set of techniques that have been developed to generate very efficient code from just high-level descriptions of this finite difference stencil for finite difference problems. So techniques like time tiling and so on that generate extremely complicated, very efficient code from high-level descriptions of the finite difference problem. Those can be done by compilers. A different style of using dependence graphs is used for sparse direct methods. Here, the compiler cannot find the dependencies because the dependencies depend on the non-zeros in the input matrix that you want to factorize. But uh, there was a lot of wonderful work back in the late 70s by Duff, Ian Duff, uh, Raid, and others. And what they showed was that it was possible at runtime after the input has been given to you, but before you uh, execute the factorization code, to examine the non-zero structure, build a dependence graph, and then actually execute the factorization in parallel. So these are the successes. What happens if you go beyond matrix programs? So these are sometimes called irregular programs. There's no clear definition of what an irregular program is, but for our discussion today, just think of them as uh, programs that deal with pointer-based data structures, such as trees and graphs and so on. So what I've shown you on the right is a pseudocode for an irregular program. You can see there are two data structures, a mesh and a work list, and uh, there are no arrays, no array subscripts. So in order to do dependence analysis here, you need a different set of techniques. What you can do is look at the loop, which is a while loop over there, and then you can ask the same question that we asked before for array programs, which is, let's find the read and write sets of each iteration and see whether they overlap or not, and if they don't, then we can say the iterations can run in parallel. Starting in the 80s, there was a tremendous amount of work on points to and shape analysis, which you can think of as dependence analysis techniques for these kinds of irregular programs. However, all of them would come back and say the read-write sets of different iterations overlap, potentially, so there's no parallelism here that we can find. So the compiler was failing to find any parallelism in these kinds of codes. So the question was, uh, is that because there's no parallelism in these irregular programs, or is it because we need more sophisticated uh, dependence analysis techniques? So those were the kind of questions that we started asking in the late 90s, early 2000s. That leads to the next lesson, which is to answer questions like that. It's not enough to study programs. Right? Rather, we need to study the underlying algorithms and data structures in those programs. So what does that mean? Well, all of us love benchmarks, right? And we have these large benchmark suites, and it's just you know, a big chunk of C++ code or whatever it is. And then we run these benchmark programs, and we find different metrics and parameters, and here's the performance and so on. But if you ask most people, at least in my area of computer science, what do these programs actually do? The answer is, well, uh, we don't know. It's some computational science program. What I'm saying is, if you want to understand at a deep level what you can change and what you cannot change in these kinds of programs, you really need to understand the underlying algorithms and data structures. And so I've taken this particular motto from Niklaus Wirth's famous book, which is called Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equals Programs. So Niklaus Wirth, as you probably know, uh, is the inventor of uh, Pascal, later Modular. He won the Turing Award some years back for his wonderful work in programming languages. I remember reading this book when I was a graduate student, and I went through it, and I said, what, what is this stuff? This seems completely trivial. But like a lot of these lessons, right, you keep thinking about it, and then years afterwards, it suddenly hits you, and you say, oh, yeah, that's what Niklaus Wirth meant, right? 
So let's take a look at what it means to look at algorithms and data structures rather than only looking at programs. What I've shown you on the left is uh, uh, this program that we were looking at. It turns out this program implements a very old, very famous algorithm called Delaunay mesh refinement. So I'll explain the uh, basic algorithm and the data structures to you. So the input to this program is a triangular mesh like the one that I've shown at the top. Now, some of these triangles are badly shaped according to some shape criteria. We don't need to worry about what the criteria are, but for example, the triangle may be too big or one of the angles is too small. Whatever it is, by looking at the coordinates of a triangle, we can classify it as bad in which case we'll mark it red and everything else is good, so we won't worry about it. What we want to do is to eliminate all these bad triangles from the mesh that's done by uh, iterative refinement. So what you essentially do is you pick a bad triangle and then you want to split it into smaller triangles, but if you only do that, it affects certain other geometric conditions that all triangles need to satisfy for triangles around it. So what you actually do is you pick a bad triangle, you compute what's called its cavity, which is just a region of the triangles surrounding this bad triangle. So I've shown those in blue, and now you remove all of them from the mesh, and then you replace them with new triangles like I've shown below. Now some of these newly created uh, triangles may themselves be bad, but there's a guarantee in 2D that if you just keep doing this long enough, you'll ultimately get a mesh without any badly shaped triangles. Now I had a demo for you that would have shown this very clearly, but it turns out my demo runs only on PCs. The folks at the back are all, it's a Mac shop. And so I spent a very uh, difficult one hour yesterday evening sweating, wondering what to do about it. And then they came up with this nice idea that maybe what we can do is simply show a movie. And so I want to thank them while you see this movie. So what you can see over here is we're picking different uh, bad triangles, computing their cavity, and then replacing them with new triangles. And as you can see, some of the new triangles are themselves bad. But if you watch till the end of the movie, and I'm not going to do that because this is about as long as a Bollywood movie, so you will see that ultimately you'll get a mesh without any badly shaped triangles, okay? So what I've shown you is, I've told you the data structures, right? There's a work list of bad triangles and then you just keep processing that work list until it's empty. And then there is this mesh and you're updating this mesh. And the way you're updating it is by taking bad triangles, computing their cavity, which is a small region around the bad triangle, removing all of those triangles and replacing them with new triangles. So now if you ask the same question, right, is there parallelism in this algorithm? The answer is surely very obvious, which is that if I take two bad triangles that are far enough away in the mesh that their cavities don't overlap, I can do this uh, process of refinement, right, in parallel. If on the other hand the cavities overlap, then I can do them in one order or the other, but I cannot do them in parallel. So once you see the algorithm, once you see the data structures, you immediately understand why compilers cannot find this parallelism. Because each iteration of that, oops. Can we go back? Yeah, each iteration of that while loop is essentially fixing one bad triangle, and at compile time, you have no idea which bad triangles different iterations are processing, whether they're close enough in the mesh that their cavities might overlap and so on. So fundamentally, you have to find parallelism in these kinds of applications while running the program in parallel. And that sounds difficult, but I'll show you how that can be done. So that led, leads me to the last of these high-level lessons, which is non-determinism is our enemy if, uh, for parallel programmers, but don't care non-determinism is our friend. So what does that mean? I'm going to explain don't care non-determinism, which is a concept that uh, Edson Dijkstra uh, talked about a long time ago, back in 1975 in his language of guarded commands. So like so many other ideas in our field, you know, uh, we owe this to Edson Dijkstra. 
So I'll explain the concept of don't care non-determinism using the same example. So it turns out that the final mesh that you get for a given input mesh, right, could be different for different orders of processing the bad triangles, even in a sequential implementation. Because what you do is you walk over the mesh, collect all the bad triangles, put them in the work list, and then you just keep working on that work list. Well, depending upon how you organize that work list, right, you'll end up with different final meshes because when you have these triangles that are very close that their cavities overlap, right, what you do depends, the ultimate mesh depends on the order in which you do them. However, in applications, all of those orders are acceptable. So this is the kind of, uh, this is what, an example of don't care non-determinism. It's not coming from race conditions, rather it's coming from under specification of the order in which these bad triangles should be processed. If you're saying, do them in any order, well, different orders may give you different results. All of them are equally acceptable. It's similar to what we do with reduction operators, right? But this is the name that Dijkstra gave it. Very important concept. We're gonna lift it up high level and then use it. So this is don't care non-determinism. This is again one of those very important concepts, in my opinion, very important lessons that we learned, which again, I think in our community, we don't quite appreciate because if you open up a book on parallel programming, again, you're not going to find much of a discussion of don't care non-determinism. I think it's a very important concept. <clears throat> okay, I've told you about four of these important high-level lessons. Now, if you know the uh, management consultancy, uh, consultancy company, McKinsey and Co., what they always say is whenever you hear a spiel from somebody, you should always say, so what, right? So these are lessons. Wh what are we going to do with them? How are we going to solve this Joe Stephanie problem, the abstractions, and so on? That's what I want to cover in the second half of my talk. So here is the next lesson that we learned, and this was a very painfully learned lesson. It took us a long time to realize this. You should think about algorithms, express algorithms, using what I'm going to call data-centric abstractions. Now, the word data-centric has become you know, very popular in this age of big data, and everybody is doing data-centric and so on. I'm going to use that term to mean a particular thing that I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So in particular, here is our motto, which parallels Niklaus Wirth's motto. In our opinion, algorithms should be described as an operator and a schedule. And I'll tell you what those are in a minute. But then a parallel program you should think about as an operator, a schedule, and a collection of parallel data structures. So to explain this, I'm going to contrast it with the standard control-centric way of thinking about algorithms. So if you open up a book on even sequential programming, just a book on algorithms, what they do is they give you a chunk of uh, pseudocode, right? And then you look at that pseudocode and you're supposed to understand the algorithm from that. So what that pseudocode, the implicit picture in, behind that pseudocode is the following model of computing, which today we call the von Neumann model, which is there's an initial state for the program when you're running it, and then you do a, se uh, a sequence of state updates and ultimately you get to the final state, right? So this is what we're all familiar with. So how do you do the state updates? Each state update is done by an assignment statement. And so an assignment statement is simply making a small local modification to the overall state. So it updates the value in one or more memory cells. Now, in general, in your algorithm, you have a lot of assignment statements, so you have to specify the order in which those should be executed. That's done using control flow uh, constructs. So if then else is while loop sequential composition and so on. So the way that the standard way of thinking about algorithms works is you do these small state updates, and then these state updates are implemented using assignment statements, and then you sequence them using control flow constructs. That's the program, and then at runtime, you have a program counter that tells you which assignment statement to do next, right? Now, the difficulty in taking this way of thinking about algorithms and then trying to find parallelism is that fundamentally that program counter is just pointing to one thing, and then you, know, you have to do all of those kinds of analyses and so on that we talked about earlier in order to find the parallelism. And that can be very difficult, as we've seen. <clears throat> and so this is what 
John Backus, the inventor of Fortran, who got the Turing Award in 1979, called the von Neumann bottleneck. So this way of thinking about algorithms in terms of one state update at a time, right? He called it the von Neumann bottleneck, and ironically, even though he was the inventor of Fortran, he said what we should do is get rid of all imperative languages altogether and move to purely functional languages. And he said with functional languages, there's lots of parallelism. So the future of parallel programming is functional programming. Now back at that time, I had just started my graduate studies at MIT. I worked with Arvind, who was working on data flow and functional languages at the time. So we were incredibly happy when we saw John Backus's Turing lecture, and we said, yes, we are the future, right? Functional programming, that's what everybody is going to be doing soon. Today, I see the world in a very different way. And so this leads to our way, our current way of thinking about parallelism in algorithms. So this is what we call the operator formulation. It's a data-centric way of thinking about algorithms. So in all the algorithms that we've looked at, and you can think about the algorithms you know, let's say there's a data structure, and then there are sites in that data structure where there is work to be done. So I gave you the example of Delaunay mesh refinement. The mesh is the data structure. There were these uh, bad triangles. So those are sites where there is work that needs to be done. So we are going to call those active nodes within that data structure. They could be active edges, active triangles, whatever it is. We'll keep it simple and just say active nodes. So the data structure, there are just sites in that data structure where there is work to be done. So what is the work that you do at a single active node? That's the state update. So this is what we call the operator. So the operator sounds fancy, but it's just a small sequence of assignment statements, conditionals, loops, whatever it is, that specifies the state update that needs to be done at a single active node. So you can think of it as a local view of the algorithm. For the DMR example, the Delaunay mesh refinement example, that's the expand cavity, remove triangles, put new triangles in, and so on. So all of that would be the operator. It does a local update to the state. Now, in general, you have multiple uh, active nodes at any given time, so you need to tell the implementation, right, whether there are any constraints in the order in which those active nodes should be processed. So that's what we call ordering, and so if there is some ordering that needs to be maintained, well, then you can specify that as part of your specification of the algorithm, and we do it just using integer priorities. It's really as simple as that. Otherwise, for algorithms like DMR, as we know, those are what we call unordered algorithms. And for unordered algorithms, the implementation is free to pick any active node in order to process it at any given point. Where do the active nodes come from? So this is just to build a little bit of intuition. We differentiate between what we call topology-driven algorithms and data-driven algorithms. Data-driven algorithms are like DMR, so there's an initial set of active nodes, and then as you process active nodes, you get more active nodes, and then ultimately you run out of active nodes, and at that point your algorithm is done. So those are what we call data-driven algorithms. We've seen an example of that. In topology-driven algorithms, the algorithm is executed in rounds, and in each round, all of the nodes are initially active, and then you apply the operator to all of them, or some subset of those nodes. So finite difference tensors are a great example. So you have an initial grid, and if you're doing something like the heat equation, for example, using a five-point stencil, so if the boundaries are fixed at certain temperatures, then the interior points are the active nodes in each round, and then you apply the operator. We, in fact, you guys even call it the finite uh, stencil operator. You apply the stencil to each active node, and then you get a new mesh, and then you keep going. So those are what we call topology-driven algorithms. So the key idea is, rather than think in terms of program counter and so on, we think of algorithms in this data-centric way, where there are these sites in these data structures where there is work to be done, and then we apply these local state updates to, uh, at each active node, and then if there's some ordering that needs to be respected, that's specified as part of the algorithm. <clears throat> so let's now take this uh, model and then see what the implications are for Joe's and Stephanie's. So for Joe's, 
for an unordered algorithm, what we give them is a set iterator. So this is a concept that goes back to settle back in the 70s. So what is a set iterator? If they're there in C++, Java, and so on. So it looks something like this. If W is a set, you can say for each element of this set, do the following, B of E. Okay, so think of W as the work set. And then what you're saying is for each element in that work set, do the body of the loop, which is in fact the operator. A set doesn't have any a priori order. So even in C++ Java, the order in which that iteration happens is undefined. That's how we exploit don't care non-determinism. So in a very natural way, we said that was important. This is how we're going to have Joe specify that don't care non-determinism. So that mesh refinement example that we talked about, the pseudocode would look like the one on the right. So I think it's a fairly natural way of thinking about these algorithms. One difference from Java C++ set iterators and what we do is that new elements can be added to the set while you're iterating over it, as you saw in the Delaunay mesh refinement example. So that means we need more sophisticated implementations, but it's basically a set iterator on steroids. For ordered algorithms, again, we borrow the idea of ordered set iterators, except that we allow new elements to be added to the set while we are iterating in order. That order is usually a partial order, and that's what gives you some parallelism. Okay, so that's how Joe writes his program, so there's no explicit parallelism threads and all of that, but he's told us, or she's told us basically, how, uh, where there is uh, this don't care non-determinism and what this operator is, what the data structures are, and so on. And now it's Stephanie's job to implement these programs in parallel. So for unordered algorithms, basically the activities have to be executed atomically, right? So that is the transactional semantics as we call it. And so if you say what can be done in parallel, well, if you have a lot of active nodes, you can uh, do active nodes in parallel as long as their neighborhoods, as we call it, the region of state that they affect, are disjoint. Ordered algorithms are essentially the same idea. For lack of time, I'm going to skip over them. The key question is, how do you find activities with disjoint neighborhoods? So that is the difficult job that uh, the Stephanies of the world need to, uh, uh, to solve in order to exploit parallelism in this way of thinking about algorithms. The fact that you have all of these active nodes tells you where the parallelism is, but now you need to find these activities with, uh, that are disjoint neighborhoods. One approach is we could use speculative execution, and what speculative execution means is the implementation just goes, picks some set of these active nodes, and then each thread starts expanding the neighborhoods and so on. And then if they find conflicts, because they need to lock all the elements in their neighborhood, if they find conflicts, they roll back and then try again and so on. So this is very standard in the database literature. This is speculative execution, which we talked about very early on, except that we're going to do this now at the level of this kind of parallelism rather than instruction level parallelism. But speculative execution is a very heavy duty mechanism. And so this is the final lesson actually, exploit context and structure for efficiency. So what does that mean? So the concept that I want you to take away is what is called binding time in programming languages. In this context, it simply means when do you know the active nodes and neighborhoods? So in the very simplest uh, algorithms like dense linear algebra, stencil codes, and so on, you know all the active nodes and neighborhoods at compile time. If you're doing a stencil code, you have a grid, you know the active nodes are all the interior nodes. If you're doing a heat equation, you know the uh, stencil, so you know the neighborhoods. So the compiler can find the parallelism and uh, generate parallel code. And this is, of course, what we have been doing using all those dependence analysis techniques and so on. For more complicated algorithms, the active nodes and neighborhoods depend on the input to the program. So sparse linear algebra is an example. So there you examine the input, determine active nodes and neighborhoods, and then generate a schedule for the active nodes and neighborhoods at that point. 
Even more complicated examples are these mesh refinement ex uh, problems that we've been looking at. So there, you know the active nodes and neighborhoods only at runtime, and so you can use what's called interference graph techniques, where basically the implementation picks a subset of the active nodes, expands the neighborhoods, looks for non-conflicting neighborhoods, right? And there are very efficient techniques using what are called interference graphs for doing that. So it finds a subset of uh, non-interfering activities and then executes those in parallel and then it goes to the next round and so on. So that's called interference graph techniques. So we have implemented those. And then the most complicated algorithms like discrete event simulation, there is an order in which the activities must appear to have been done. And for those, you can fall back on speculative execution. So what I want you to take away from this one slide is that speculative execution, in my opinion, should be the basis for thinking about parallel computing. It works for all kinds of algorithms, but it's like a very big hammer, right? And so whenever there's structure in your problem, you can do early binding time and then get rid of some of the work that the speculative execution would have done at runtime. And for the simplest algorithms like dense linear algebra and stencils, you actually don't need to do any of that work at runtime because you can do it at compile time. So it's a unified way of looking at parallelism in all kinds of algorithms. Uh, I have some graphs over here just to show you that everything that I've talked about is actually real and gives you real speed ups, but for lack of time, I see Bern looking very worried, so I'm going to skip over the performance slides. I'm happy to share the slides with you. But basically, what it shows you is uh, performance for uh, Delaunay mesh refinement on an SGI ultraviolet 512 threads using the techniques that I've talked about. We've built lots of systems based on these ideas, right? you actually get a speed up, actually, of uh, about 300 for that refinement loop on 512 threads. Okay, so this is my uh, last slide, so some final remarks. We talked about functional languages and how, you know, Bacchus advocated going to functional languages for exploiting parallelism. Imperative languages are not going to work. Where are you going to find the threads? There's only a program counter. At this point, as I was telling you, in my life, I believe functional languages are neither necessary nor sufficient for parallel programming. There may be perfectly good reasons for using functional languages. They're easier to debug, you know, all of those sorts of things. But fundamentally, for exploiting parallelism, I don't believe you need functional languages. So in that case, where do you get the threads from? There's a program counter, one time on bottleneck. Okay, you just change your way of thinking into this data-centric way of thinking where you think about sites in a data structure where there's work to be done. Think data-centric, and then I think it becomes very clear where the, the threads are going to come from. And as I've told you, we've implemented a lot of systems over the past 10 years based on these ideas, many uh, DARPA projects based on these ideas. So it actually does work. And uh, if you're interested in knowing more, please do get in touch with me. Uh, languages can be a problem, but they're rarely ever a solution. So this is from David Cook. Back when I graduated, I interviewed at UIUC. David was not able to come for my talk, but I had a meeting with him. And so he started off by saying, so what do you do? Tell me. And I swelled up with pride and I said, we do functional languages, and that is the future of parallel programming and so on. So I held forth for about 10 minutes. David, for those of you who know him, you know, is a very polite, very gentle gentleman, right? So he listened politely, and then at the end he said, you know, in my experience, languages can be a problem, but they're rarely ever a solution. And I thought, oh man, this guy's been doing Fortran for so long, he's really out of it. He doesn't know functional languages are the future. So David spent about uh, five or six years sometime back in Austin because uh, he works for Intel. They transferred him to the Intel lab in Austin. He used to come for my group meetings, got to know him very well. And so at one point, after I'd gotten to know him well, I told him the story. I said, David, you probably don't remember telling me this, but back then I thought, ah, this guy has been doing Fortran too long and so on. Now I see the point 25 years later about what you were trying to tell me. So this is from David Cook. 
That doesn't mean that domain-specific languages are bad. So when we're saying languages can be a problem, what we're saying is this parallelism problem fundamentally doesn't have anything to do with functional languages or not. Domain-specific languages, however, are in fact a great idea. So compilers are like skiers. They can go downhill very easily. Going uphill is hard. So if you can lift the level of abstraction to whatever domain is relevant for what you want to do, that's actually a wonderful idea. And before Burnt beats me up, here is all of the lessons that I told you on one slide. So seven lessons. I'm going to leave it there for you to read and answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Again. So thank you so much for this insightful talk. And I think we have at least time for one or two quick questions. Uh, you can line up at the microphone, so you type in uh, at the online forum. I think John Sopka wants to answer, yeah. ask a question. John has a question. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't mind. Thank you very much, John Sopka. From uh, Boston area. Wonderful talk. I really appreciate it. I'd like to ask uh, Professor Pengali if he has a catchphrase or a name for the architecture that we would call data centric as opposed to the old 20th century von Neumann architecture, which was control centric. If not, I'd like to suggest that we might start referring to it as the Pengali. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, John. But, uh, you know, we call it the operator formulation of algorithms. And I have to say it didn't really catch on because, you know, operator probably doesn't mean a whole lot to people. But, yeah, if you have a catchphrase for it, I'd love to know what it is. So do tell me. <laughs> okay. So I I there's, there's a, there's a, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, hello, Professor Pingali. Thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, this is Ketan Maheshwari from Oak Ridge National Lab. Um, so it looks like from your talk, um, you know, obviously you have de dealt with very, very complex problems, but it really caught my eye that the solutions and the programs were strikingly simple. Um, and it seems like lately the software complexity has significantly increased. And my, I have two questions when I say that. Is this observation and assessment correct in your opinion? And if so, what do you think about um, increasing software complexity that is kind of you know, taking over these days? Okay, so that's a great question. And the way I would answer it is, uh, first of all, my experience in building systems is that unless the underlying ideas are very simple, the complexity tends to overwhelm you very quickly. Okay, and the example that everybody gives is Unix versus Multics, right? So Multics started out, very ambitious project. Well, how many people in the audience have heard of Multics? Probably only people my age, right? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to insult you folks. But, you know, everybody uses Unix, right? Multics, people don't, because it just got too complicated. And so in my opinion, systems have to be simple. If it's not simple, they don't work, okay? And people won't pick, pick up on them. Having, so that's one part of my answer. Now, the other part of uh, the answer I want to give you is you're absolutely right. People are writing huge uh, programs, you know, 100,000 lines and so on. We're going to need other techniques, like the techniques that people use in object-oriented languages, for example, encapsulation. You know, all of that is absolutely essential for managing the complexity of very large programs. In my opinion, that's all orthogonal to what I was talking about here, which is focusing on how do we think about parallelism in the first place? Right. But all of those techniques are absolutely essential. I'm a big believer in object-oriented languages. I love functional languages even now, but you know, it's like, I don't know what they're really good for in the parallel context, but I love them anyway. All right, thank okay. you, appreciate our answer. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you very much again. Let's thank you, Bert. Give a big applause. Thank you. Thank you. You are 